The evening in the morning takes place around the year 1000. It's the end of the Dark Ages and the beginning of the Middle Ages. And what we're seeing is a conflict between people who want England to be ruled by law and people who prefer the old ways. So this is the point at which England begins to change and the main drama of the story comes in conflict about that change. After the Pillars of the Earth, I wrote two books which took place in the same town, Kingsbridge, in later periods of history. The Evening and the Morning takes place in Kingsbridge at an earlier period of history. The richest source of information about this period of history is uh, what we call the Bayou Tapestry, which is a sort of enormous comic strip embroidered on linen showing uh, the story of England and Normandy and how the Normans came to be the rulers of England. And the great thing about the Bayou Tapestry is the details of everyday life. It's a time when horses were terribly important and a lot of people go places on horseback. So it's important to know what it was like. They didn't have docks. You wanted to go aboard a ship. You hitched up the skirts of your tunic around your waist and you walked through the shallow water. And in my story, people go between England and Normandy quite a lot. So this depiction is helpful to me. If you want to do historical novels, you've got to get this stuff right. Now, architecture excites me because it tells of a way of life, you see. We're at Glastonbury Abbey. There has been a monastery here since the first century AD, and two of my characters visited at different times. Edgar wants to build a canal, and he wants to see how they've done it. Alden comes here, he is a monk. He comes here to beg a gift. His little monastery is broke, and he thinks that if he can get the relics of a saint, it will attract pilgrims and they will make money out of the pilgrims. I won't tell you whether he gets it, you have to read the book. The evening and the morning certainly has some strong female characters, as my books always do. When we first meet Ragnar in France, she's already a young woman of importance. She rules over extensive lands, she acts as a judge, but she falls in love with an Anglo-Saxon chieftain and she goes to England to marry him. She finds that England is relatively lawless and that her husband's family is violent and completely ruthless. But she doesn't just accept this. She cultivates her own allies. She builds her own power base and she fights back. Hello. Welcome. Wow. One of my characters is a boat builder, Edgar, who is really the hero of the story. The best boats at the time were those of the Vikings. Happily, there is in Oslo a wonderful museum called the Viking Ship Museum. They have reconstructed the warships in which the Vikings came from Denmark and Norway to raid southern England. But when they attacked towns and villages, they would steal anything valuable that they could carry away, like silver ornaments from the church. They also took the young men and women as slaves. The worst thing you could see would be five or six of those damn Viking ships approaching up the river or approaching the beach of your town. Then you knew you were in for hell on earth. In the opening of my story, the young hero, Edgar, is on the beach at dawn and coming towards him. This is what he sees with a dragon's head right at the front. And of course, it's a completely terrifying sight. So here is a dragon's head. Gosh, the carving is extraordinary, isn't it? The look, the grandeur, and the grace of those ships is really a very important image for this book. For the cover of the evening and the morning, for the first time, I've started working with an artist before the book is finished. 
And so I took Darren Cook, who is a designer who's worked on um, the covers of my books now for several years. And I took him with me to Oslo because I wanted him to see the helmets and the carving, because I knew that these things would inspire him. When, when you see runic letter forms, they locate a piece in history so specifically. A lot of the characters are very similar to an M, a runic M is very similar to an M that we would use today. So there's a really good opportunity here to create a branded look for the title, which is inspired by the runic alphabet. By the time the book is finished, we will have a very vivid idea of what the cover should look like all over the world. Now we're in the east of England, not far from the cathedral city of Lincoln. I was very pleased to find Dave Greenhalgh. He's a, an expert in ancient coins, and he's also a very practical guy, and he has a forge, and he actually makes replica coins in the way that they were made in Anglo-Saxon times. Part of the plot of the evening and the morning is that somebody's forging silver pennies, the only money in Anglo-Saxon England. That can go in. This is how you make the fire hotter. And all this done with no electricity. Yep. They take a pound of silver penny, melt it down, mix it with a pound of copper, and make twice as many pennies as they had before. Double your money. Oof. If you just tried to imagine this, you would have no idea. A novel is full of physical details, of houses and churches and landscapes. All emotional stuff is based on physical description and all physical description ought to have emotional weight. You've got to make it real in the reader's mind. You've got to make the reader have an emotional reaction to this story. It's a kind of enchantment. I'm in this book and I really care more about what's going to happen in the next chapter of this book than what's going to happen to me tomorrow. That's a magic spell, and it's actually, in the end, it's the only thing that matters.